Well, let me begin by thanking Gulzat for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here. It's uh, great to be part of this discussion. And uh, it just happens that uh, uh, I've been thinking about money for quite some time now because um, uh, we've been doing research on uh, debt. So um, I'm quite happy to share my thoughts and I'd be um, interested in uh, um, hearing your feedback and I hope that uh, you know some of the um, insights that emerged uh, during my research um, you know might be helpful to some of you actually a lot of the things that uh, um, people mentioned during their discussion and in their presentations um, you know I, I think I uh, bring it out in uh, my presentation as well so um, let me begin with a couple of vignettes um, in uh, 2016, um, you know, uh, a group of uh, uh, about 700 people uh, protested uh, in front of the U.S. Embassy, uh, demanding that amnesty uh, and uh, actually accusing um, the United States in particular of uh, um, indebting um, people in, in Kyrgyzstan. And here you can see them uh, holding placards, uh, you know, um, with, with a sign saying, um, Micro, microcredit uh, is a debt trap, Occupy Finca, mm, uh, we are uh, part of the 99%, uh, save my home from the bank. And uh, the, what they were trying to do is actually, uh, and this I think has hap happened for the first time in Kyrgyzstan, is actually to show, to expose the link between international capital and indebtedness in, in Kyrgyzstan. And, uh, you know, draw attention of the public uh, to the situation. And uh, the, the um, you know, uh, this did actually, you know, um, draw attention of the public. Uh, the uh, protests were covered widely by the local press. But, um, you know, as, as I sort of um, uh, followed the coverage of the press, one thing that stood out was that, um, you know, um, the media and uh, a lot of the financial experts that were interviewed to explain uh, this, this, uh, the nature of this protest and particularly explain the location uh, of these protests because uh, the journalists kept asking, you know, what on earth, you know, the US embassy has to do with any of this? Um, you know, why are they not protesting in, in front of the White House? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the answers, and I mean, it's a good question. It's, it's, a, it's actually goes uh, right to the heart of the matter. Um, but, you know, the, the um, journalists actually failed to investigate the matter. And uh, what they ended up doing is actually just demonizing um, the protesters, uh, the, the a good you know, portion of whom actually constituted rural women. And um, similar type of grievances were, uh, expressed in Kazakhstan as well. So um, here you have, uh, again, uh, quite a lot of women uh, protesting um, uh, inside the National Bank in Kazakhstan and outside. And uh, um, the same uh, demand for debt amnesty was also uh, voiced in Kazakhstan. And then um, you could see how women actually, um, you know, uh, put uh, gray sacks on their heads. And you can see ropes uh, that they used around their necks to actually symbolize uh, the kind of stranglehold uh, that had on their lives. So if we would try to sort of take uh, their grievances seriously, uh, rather than dismissing them the way financial experts did in Kyrgyzstan, um, you can see that uh, they are communicating that there is trouble with money. And uh, uh, here, um, you know, this, this is from another uh, gathering that took place in Bishkek. Uh, these are some of the uh, uh, claims uh, that uh, indebted people raised. So the, the, uh, for those of you who don't uh, sort of read Russian, uh, the uh, claims in English uh, are, uh, we're not slaves of the financial system. Uh, financial system um, has to serve the needs of the people and uh, we demand monetary reform. So, and uh, if we pay attention to these claims, we can see that um, they're not simply communicating grievances with money. Uh, they're actually, um, you know, um, normative in their nature. 
so uh, the people are suggesting that uh, something is going wrong and the system has to change, it's ought to change, and the kind of direction it's supposed to take. Okay, so, so um, these are evaluative claims. And uh, for me, uh, you know, all these uh, claims, uh, you know, if, if, if we, the analytical focus on the debt then forces us actually to think about the, um, you know, the money. So what is money? What is its purpose? What is its value? Uh, and, can, can, and how the uh, purpose and the value of money change? Uh, so how did that change occur? Because uh, from uh, the you know, protests and grievances, you can already see that uh, people are indicating that um, the change did occur and they're unhappy about it. So why and how did the change uh, take place? And uh, what are the social implications of this change? So, um, you know, uh, somewhere else we address also the political and economic implications of this. But here uh, I'm going to, um, you know, due to the lack of time, just talk about the social implication of that. So the um, empirical uh, base for this uh, talk um, uh, are the semi structured interviews that we conducted in 2016 and in 2017 in uh, three cities, in what you know back then was Astana and Almaty and Bishkek. So uh, we uh, gained access to uh, key uh, commercial banks. Uh, to my credit uh, companies, so uh, uh, about 12 uh, banks uh, 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 were used uh, for the interviews. Um, one pawn shop, uh, uh, nine uh, international financial institutions, uh, of course, governmental agencies. Um, uh, then uh, we uh, interviewed uh, um, borrowers. Uh, uh, these, these were primarily actually from uh, Kyrgyzstan um, and uh, also um, we conducted uh, a focus group discussion with um, the leaders of the um, anti-debt movement that at that time already was actually um, quite uh, active in Bishkek. And uh, by, uh, I keep saying we, I, I should mention here that uh, uh, this research project uh, was a joint research project. Uh, uh, so uh, Dr. Balihar Sangera and uh, myself uh, were um, engaged in this research. And, uh, um, and, and uh, so, yeah, so, uh, the, um, the, the approach that we're using to address uh, all these questions, uh, the broadly speaking, is the moral economy approach. And so, you know, what's the value of it? So why moral economy approach? Well, the, the main, one main reason that this approach views uh, economy as a set of, so here, for instance, referring it to money, money is not a thing. It wouldn't be a thing. And it, it is a set of complex social relations. So therefore it requires sort of, you know, unpacking these social relations and assessing them in terms of their power. And I think uh, many of you already done that in your, uh, uh, in your works and you've actually showed how, you know, money is, uh, you know, invariably linked to social relations. So uh, moral economy approach, in addition, uh, views all economic activities as um, um, embedded in uh, uh, norms and values. So, you know, there is no such thing as value neutral uh, economic activity. Hence, we need to then uh, examine, uh, you know, all the uh, norms and values, uh, the justifications that are used to, to um, you know, explain uh, these economic activities. So, you know, uh, they are certainly shaped uh, by them. And then, you know, this, this is also an approach that um, uh, actually, you know, encourages us to uh, interrogate those more norms and values, uh, not take them at the face value, but then assess them as well. Uh, you know, is this, is this um, you know, uh, how are make, people making these judgments? 
So what are the contradictions? Uh, you know, uh, when, when people are using the language of something, you know, money being fair, uh, virtuous, uh, or, you know, a bad, uh, certain practices fair or unfair. So, you know, uh, what 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 are they using? What's the merit of of uh, those judgments? Um, and uh, you could you know probably uh, um, are aware that there are several uh, strands within the uh, broader moral economy approach, and different scholars sort of you know um, rely on uh, different. Uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, figures uh, to, to, to sort of evaluate this um, matters. And here I'm actually, you know, I've been, I've been uh, rediscovering the um, value of Polanyi and employing Polanyian analysis uh, in particular because um, his concepts of uh, fictitious commodities and uh, the laissez affair and uh, uh, the double movement uh, have been actually quite uh, useful uh, and, um, uh, you know, I think uh, fictitious commodities in particular is, is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, helpful in explaining uh, the transformation of the morality of money in Central Asia. And uh, Polanyi uh, actually argued that, uh, you know, uh, market society transforms, uh, you know, certain resources, uh, which previously actually were not commodities, into commodities. So he clearly, you know, identified three, uh, you know, labor, land, and money. Uh, today we can probably add to that knowledge, uh, you know, the commodification of uh, uh, welfare services and, uh, uh, you know, uh, other uh, uh, goods uh, and resources. Um, but uh, how he, did he define the commodification? It's uh, where the commodification of money is uh, uh, how we can see that it's, uh, you know, acquiring uh, the um, value of the commodity is that it, it, it uh, gets a price, uh, which is measured as the uh, interest rate. So the key feature of commodified money is the interest. Uh, and obviously rent uh, would be the price of the land and uh, wage is the uh, price of the uh, labor power. Um, Polanyi, I think, you know, the, another sort of, you know, crucial um, value of his analysis, uh, sort of uh, in, in, in comparison to probably other um, scholars, he's the one who uh, emphasized the nature, uh, the globalized nature of uh, um, economy. And uh, he um, sort of stressed that the commodification process uh, does not happen on its own, it's not a natural process, uh, that there are forces behind it. So hence the uh, assertion that laissez affair is planned, uh, you know, uh, forces us to look at, you know, um, social forces uh, as well as, uh, you know, instruments and institutions uh, that are uh, assisting uh, that. And, uh, uh, Polanyi uh, stressed that uh, actually the state played the key role in this process uh, and uh, uh, that the laissez faire movement, uh, hence the notion of the double movement. So the, 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 you know, uh, the forces that pushed for the commodification uh, of uh, resources, um, he identified them as the laissez faire movement. Now, who are these laissez faire uh, members of this? Uh, laissez faire movement, um, you know, I could probably, uh, depends on the context, but uh, here I'll try to explain, uh, give examples of, of, of um, the representatives of the laissez faire movement. Uh, now, expanding on, on, on Polanyi, uh, here I'm drawing upon uh, Bob Jessup, actually, who, uh, you know, um, uh, identified seven stages of uh, commodification uh, of money, so it's 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 uh, um, not enough to talk about uh, you know money that that was a non commodity, and then uh, the money that became a, a, a fictitious commodity, uh, but uh, the process of commodification is actually quite complex, and uh, it it very much uh, depends on the context and. Uh, uh, so hence, you know, Bob Jessup identifies seven stages of it. Uh, there is 
you know, here, no need to go into the specifics of all the seven stages, but it suffice to say that uh, in uh, um, pre-capitalist societies, uh, uh, this is where money, uh, the purpose of money, money was used as money. Uh, uh, and hence it was defined as a non-commodity. So when money is used as just a token of exchange, uh, it's, 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 it, it, you know, it operates as money, as, uh, as, as money as money, and it's a non-commodity. Um, when it's um, uh, used, so, you know, uh, remember the key distinction that, uh, you know, when, uh, money acquires a price. Uh, so um, in, in certain societies, uh, so the interest rate and the exchange rate uh, was there. So uh, Jessup defines this kind of money as functional money uh, and as a simple commodity, but it's still not a fictitious capital or a full capitalist commodity. So um, here um, you would still have um, uh, the, the key distinction, uh, sort of uh, some kind of um, regulation of money and uh, money by and large is not produced to be sold on the market, okay? Um, so um, one of the things that I, I, I suppose need to emphasize, because some of you mentioned uh, the, the um, role of credit, so the distinction between credit and debt. So um, Polanyi and probably many of you read the works of um, Graeber, uh, Michael Hudson, they actually emphasized that as a non-commodity, uh, in particular money was embedded uh, in what Polanyi called the substantive economy, where uh, you know, actually uh, markets didn't play uh, such, such, a, such a big role. And much of the uh, you know, uh, distribution of the goods uh, occurred either through householding reciprocity or redistribution. Um, so the, you, there were a lot of uh, um, cultural norms that actually prohibited uh, use rates. So, you know, uh, biblical traditions, you know, um, Islamic traditions um, in, in um, uh, Central Asia, we all know that, you know, uh, usury was particularly seen as a, as a sort of a harmful uh, negative activity. Um, I'm going to talk more a little bit about uh, uh, money as a functional money uh, in, in the next slide. And the, here, uh, sort of the, the crucial distinction of uh, um, transitioning to money as a, as a property. Now, this is something that uh, occurs uh, in a, a more neoliberalized, marketized uh, society. So here, money then, uh, money, the function of the money is of property. And uh, it then, uh, you know, is, is viewed as, as uh, uh, you know, um, interest um, accruing uh, credit. So it's, it's a different form of credit. And uh, um, again, key distinction here is that uh, money is now uh, produced uh, in order to be sold and traded. And, uh, you know, again, there, there are degrees of the financialization of money as property and in more advanced capitalist societies, uh, you know, like in the United States and UK, you know, it now takes the form of uh, derivatives and uh, securitization and it's, you know, traded in stock markets uh, uh, and, and etc. cetera. Uh, but, you know, within the Central Asian context, we can certainly see money now operating as, as a, uh, as, a, as a credit, hence, you know, uh, as, as a commodity, uh, as a property. Um, before I'm going to um, talk more about the commodification of money, it's important to uh, talk about the morality of money in the Soviet period. Uh, not only to sort of, you know, uh, you know draw the um, distinction between the morality of money in, in, in different economic systems, uh, but also because uh, a lot of the, um, a lot of our informants constantly drew this comparison. And in their um, sort of um, 
normative assessments of what money should be, what the value of money should be, and and you know how how things have changed and whether that changed you know uh, direction of the change, whether it's 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 uh, negative or positive. So uh, you know the, the Soviet period was uh, you know brought up uh, quite frequently, uh, and uh, you know uh, so rather than dismissing. Uh, their, their sort of, you know, um, uh, these, these, these attempts to evoke uh, the Soviet period as, as, as nostalgia and, and uh, uh, something that's no longer relevant, uh, you know, it's actually important to see, you know, why, uh, you know, the, the morality of money in the Soviet period is so important still for a lot of actors in the, you know, uh, post-socialist uh, period. So, and uh, the important part is that uh, the cornerstone of the uh, Soviet um, economic system was that um, there was this crucial distinction made between earned income and unearned income. In Russian, this is called uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the Soviet system actually uh, tried its hardest it, it failed uh, quite often, and there was a lot of discussion on this, but it tried to abolish all the sources of uh, unearned income. Uh, and uh, there were, you know, various laws passed uh, uh, during the Soviet period. They were also rewritten multiple times. Um, but the last law that uh, regulated uh, unearned income uh, is the law, um, anti-parasitic law, uh, which was passed in 1961. And it actually, you know, defined interest uh, you know, rent, uh, other uh, so-called speculative gains as a non-labor and therefore uh, and non-virtuous. So hence, you know, the, the very title of the law, the anti-parasitic uh, law. So the value of money and, uh, you know, the, 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 the virtue of money, if you will, was attached to labor. So labor was the only source of, uh, you know, Mm, uh, virtuous money uh, and and uh, the morality of money there was very much attached to labor and this was a particular kind of labor it had to be socially useful and productive so again this term of productivity uh, is is crucial and and it's emphasized and repeated many times uh, the 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 important uh, part is also to emphasize that there were uh, um, opportunities to make uh, sort of, you know, additional income from, uh, you know, what we now, you know, know as private property. Although within the Soviet law, it wasn't defined as private property. It was sort of не частная собственность, а личная собственность. Подсобное хозяйство. So there was an opportunity. It was legally permitted to, uh, you know, give your house for um, rent uh, if you had like an extra uh, space. And, and you, you wish to rent it out. Um, and we know that there were сберегательные кассы, savings deposit, uh, you know, uh, available for Soviet citizens, and they could accrue interest uh, rates on them, uh, but they were not that high from, you know, something like three to five percent. And uh, all of this uh, was actually quite strictly regulated. So, you know, uh, you, you, could make an additional income, but it's 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 you know um, not something that you know was up to individuals and um, people were aware of this. So then the sort of the moral moral hierarchy between between um, you know actors uh, in civil society were between the productive worker and the social parasites. and the proper laborer. Who, who worked actually for the good, common good of, of the, uh, uh, you know, of the society. So, um, and, and actually people uh, still make the distinction. I, I, I remember talking to, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the traders and a lot of them were actually, you know, former public sector workers, you know, uh, teachers in particular, who would, who would say that, yeah, before I, I you know, she val I valued my work because, you know, so I, 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 I worked for the, for the good of the people. 
and and now you know it's 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 kind of this kind of activity it was uh, you know uh, in in their narrative it, it, it kind of lacked that virtue uh, it was all about survival it was all about you know uh, making the money uh, you know linked to private gains and it, it lacked for them that kind of you know uh, virtue linked to um, socially useful labor. Elmira, oh. 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to try to speed it up. <laughs> so the, the uh, how then, you know, the, this transition from the, you know, Soviet uh, understanding morality of money, uh, you know, takes place in, in, in the current context. Well, for that, as Polanyi emphasized, you have to look at the, you know, uh, structural uh, conditions and, and what actually happened. So the, the market reforms that were introduced in uh, particularly in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan actually did lead to a uh, commodification of uh, not just money, but um, uh, land labor and uh, uh, other other services. And uh, uh, with, when, when the dissolution of the Soviet Union uh, happened, actually uh, these economies lacked uh, money. So money became a scarce commodity. And uh, was Central Asian states were now in a uh, 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 well forced actually to attract money from overseas, and obviously um, these were the sources of money were um, uh, private banks or you know uh, donor institutions, uh, largely uh, from the West, and uh, uh, so in, in Kyrgyzstan uh, the the. Um, international donors actually were particularly interested in uh, expanding the microcredit sector. Uh, in Kazakhstan, these were mostly uh, commercial banks. So you can see how much money um, uh, was, was, was uh, you know, borrowed uh, from uh, uh, Western uh, private capital. Uh, by 2007 in Kazakhstan, uh, you had 46 billion uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Kazakhstani, um, banks and you know it's it's not a small amount it's constituted 44 percent of the gdp um in, in kyrgyzstan uh you know the 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 uh figure um is also substantial i don't have the exact one but the um interesting thing is that in the interview when we sort of you know were talking to uh you know one of the experts within the ifc uh, international finance uh, corporation he emphasized that um it, uh, uh, it was um, important uh, for the um, uh, international uh, financial actors to, uh, to, to, to you know, develop particularly the microcredit sector. And then they mandated that sector to be uh, financially sustainable. So you know, they, 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 they wanted the loans to be distributed at commercial rates. Yet at the same time, they, they um, wrapped up sort of framed uh, all this lending as as a social lending you know so so this 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 was about like you know empowering women entrepreneurs you know as poverty reduction uh program and etc cetera, etc cetera. and i remember like you know pointing out uh, this uh, sort of you know contradiction to to him and saying like but you know if if it's uh you know uh, linked to sort of you know the the, the social goals why do the loans, why do these loans have to be, you know, so expensive and, and you know, uh, sort of uh, at, given out at commercial rates? And he said, because at the end of the day, you know, um, IFC is not a charity, it's a business. Uh, so, you know, for, we need to make money as well. And how do you then sustain this commodification of money? Well, you, you rewrite the, uh, you know, the regulation, the laws uh, within these countries. And the, the, key changes that were made since the Soviet time was obviously uh, the, the, the abolition of the, you know, uh, limit on the interest rate. So this is very important. The uh, commercial banks and microfinance institutions had the power to determine themselves how much interest they would charge, uh, you know, uh, women and uh, other borrowers. And, uh, and, uh, uh, so yeah, so essentially there was also you know no real regulation of, of this type of activity. And if in the 1990s, uh, you know, the majority of the Central Asian society was free of debt, 
Uh, by now, you have you know 80% of economically active Kazakhstani citizens in debt, um, probably about the same uh, uh, amount rate percentage of uh, Kyrgyzstani citizens. And what's important within the Kyrgyzstani context is that at least you know 62% um, of them are rural women. So uh, and 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 it's important to understand that you know the when when. Uh, international uh, forces, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, con the, the conditioned the, the uh, lending of money. It actually was embedded in a lot of neoliberal, uh, you know, values, norms and values. So, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, important to understand that there is, you know, uh, there is the seismic shift from, from, from what these norms and values were before. And and what what you know uh, there now it's it's uh, you know and it's important to sort of you know account for this change, and now you know the, the value was linked actually to um, to price, so um, the the um, distribution of goods primarily occurred through the market. Now you don't have the state playing uh, you know a crucial role. Uh, the, the, the only way, for instance, you can, you can obtain a loan is through these uh, commercial uh, institutions. The state doesn't really give out uh, loans. Um, productivity is more or less now redefined. It's whatever fetches value at the market. Um, uh, market is seen as the only fair mechanism of allocating goods. And this distinction, which was crucial in the Soviet period between the earned income and unearned income, uh, it's gone, it's erased. And um, uh, the value is now detached from labor and it's linked more to the scarcity of goods. And the moral hierarchy between, between the actors is, you know, what's, what's profitable, who's doing well, who's a great market player, who's, you know, uh, 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 obtaining most value at the market and who's, who's uh, uh, losing out. So I, I, I'm quite, you know, pleased that, you know, uh, during this discussion, a lot of you, you know, raised the question of class and, and uh, you asked me, you know, well, what, what's the role of class in, in all of this? And uh, I think it's, it's, it's crucial, actually, to talk about class because in uh, now, you know, neoliberalized uh, economy, you, you don't have a universal understanding of what's money uh, and, and the morality of money very much is class-based. So you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, financial elites who are um, very happy that they've internalized and uh, uh, the, the neoliberal morality of money. And, and, uh, and uh, now, you know, they, they define value uh, in terms of extraction. Uh, so, uh, so, so, for instance, if you, you know, here I have the image of uh, um, the CEO of the mobile lock finance, who, uh, and, and the reason I actually use him as an example is because he uh, was recently running as the presidential candidate, and uh, he, in, in, in presidential debates, kept referring to himself, I am a wealth creator. So this is the shift from a speculator uh, uh, to a wealth creator. And uh, he, uh, you know, uh, justified interest rates. So remember, you know, uh, it's it's the interest rate that's that's a problem. And interest rates in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan are the highest in the world. And uh, at the time, uh, you know, especially you know when um, there was no um, sort of pushback from society in Kyrgyzstan, uh, they were charging uh, interest rates as high as 180 percent. So and 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 uh, you know these um, e economic actors they justify uh, this form of um, uh, activity and and for them that's this is not a problem. The same you know with with a lot of the, the the new class of you know uh, bazaar owners uh, who you know uh, it's funny how you know when we were talking to. Um, um, the, the, the managers of Dordoy, they kept referring to Dordoy as the biggest employer now. That Dordoy employs up to 200,000 people. Well, Dordoy doesn't employ anyone. People employ themselves. And uh, Dordoy, what you know, the owner does, he simply collects rent. Uh, there, is, there is like no job creation uh, behind uh, what they do. Yet this is framed as, you know, uh, Dordoy employs. Uh, and um, 
for those who are at the bottom of, of uh, uh, you know, this new class uh, hierarchy, and, and we're now talking about uh, a lot of the uh, bazaar traders uh, who are, you know, uh, referred to now as the new entrepreneurs, uh, which I think they are not, they actually, you know, define money uh, as enslavement. And hence, you know, the, 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 the protesters uh, talking about, you know, debt as a problem. And, uh, you know, here I'm giving you just a couple of quotations where, you know, they're saying that, you know, we've become slaves to, to, to credit to debt. And all we're doing is working ourselves to death to cover the interest rates. And yet the debt is not going away. It keeps growing, it keeps swallowing us. So the reference debt is that something that suffocates and that's something that swallows. And they actually refer to these people, you know, the, the people like, you know, the CEO of the Moblak, to people like um, Salom Biagov, who were uh, extracting rent um, as, as, you know, bloodsuckers. So pretty much the language of, yeah, social parasites. То есть высосали всю кровь, уже нечего больше давать. And um, hence, you know, it's, it's uh, I think, very important to talk about class and, uh, and explore the multiple levels of exploitation and oppression that is now taking place in, in, in Central Asian societies. So here I'm just giving you an example. And, and you know, when I discovered the extent of exploitation, I was, I was really surprised by how much I mean, I don't know how these women go on, you know, how they're surviving in, in this type of relationship. So a single woman needs to generate profit for all these international uh, uh, lenders. Uh, you know, it's uh, up to five to seven percent. That's how the, the, the price of the money as a commodity uh, when it enters uh, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. That's the minimum. Um, then they need to generate profit for the domestic financial elites. And this is the, the minimum. Uh, um, interest rate would be something around 20 to 35 percent. Then they need to provide enough of, uh, uh, you know, uh, generate enough of revenue profit in order to cover the rent at the bazaar. And I was shocked to find out that, you know, in Dordoy, it's, it's a lot of the uh, containers, uh, you know, the, the rent starts at something like a thousand dollars. So those, those premium uh, uh, trading uh, spaces actually will, will charge a lot more for that. And, uh, you know, given that it's extremely difficult to generate so much uh, profit for all these people that are actually, by the way, not doing any labor, they're just sitting there and collecting this revenue. Um, and, and they're obviously, you know, they, they struggle and uh, very often they resort to then taking extra loans from pawn shops uh, to, to, you know, cover uh, uh, all their expenses and, and the interest rate in the pawn shops is 67% monthly. And here I wanted to sort of, you know, uh, touch upon uh, the moral work that goes into justification of money as a commodity. Uh, so, you know, money as a, as a commodity is not a problem for, uh, you know, they don't really problematize it for the new uh, elites. Uh, we refer to them as rentier class, uh, simply, you know, uh, sort of drawing on the language of uh, Adam Smith and Ricardo, who referred to them as, as the Rontia class um, uh, back in the 19th century. Uh, but it was very interesting in this interview, the owner of the uh, pawn shop, uh, you know, this is a woman who uh, previously worked as, a, as an economist, and now she owns actually both a microfinance and a pawn shop. And she was the only one, uh, there were very few of these uh, uh, new economic elites who were uncomfortable, uncomfortable with um, commodification of money. And, uh, uh, and, and it was very interesting how actually it came out uh, without me probing uh, when she uh, you know, was explaining the nature of her business. At some point she mentioned that it was a sin. And, and uh, you know, uh, then we probed her further going like, what do you mean by sin? And, and, and then she, um, you know, went into this long uh, monologue. It was really like 20 minutes long, trying to say that, you know, um, she studied various texts, uh, you know, religious texts in order to understand which text uh, permitted uh, usury and which didn't. Then, uh, you know, uh, her investigation so clearly she read Bible, she read Quran. Uh, she, she mentions that Quran clearly bans usury. And then she, she finds this, um, um, some kind of like, you know, few passages in Torah 
that says uh, that you know state that uh, you know uh, interest uh, lending with interest rates was allowed, but there were conditions. Uh, you know, so you, you you can lend it to strangers, not to your family members. Uh, and, and then there was this uh, moment, so I said, well, then are you content them, you know, so, so Torah allows this. Um, she, there was still sort of like, you know, uh, yeah, I'm sort of, uh, I understand, but I'm a Muslim, now I have this dilemma. Um, then she tried to basically equate um, lending to, you know, gays saying like, you know, well, all religious texts, uh, you know, prohibit this. So, you know, um, maybe just like not, you know, uh, refer to sort of, you know, norms and values that are expressed in various texts, clearly saying that they're outdated and have no relevance in modern life. But after saying all that, there was this uh, sort of, you know, pause where she said, ah, you can probably see what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to find some loophole somewhere that would justify, uh, you know, my, my practices, uh, you know. Uh, and, and, and then she said, no, you know, towards the end, without sort of us, you know, uh, interfering or like, you know, uh, I, I know it's a sin and, 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 and the, the, the final sort of, you know, justification uh, conclusion, you know, was that, you know, I've made a lot of people cry. So she clearly was aware of the harm that she was inflicting on people that came to her, that they came actually at a very desperate situation, they were vulnerable, were very needy, and she was using, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that as, uh, to, 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 to make profit. And then she said, the, the, this is the, the, the important bit. Although there was this awareness about, uh, you know, um, the, the uh, damage uh, uh, that, that, you know, uh, was part of her um, income. Uh, she, she said, look, uh, I'm, I'm going to carry on doing it. So I've accepted it as a sin. Let it be my worst sin. So despite the, the, the conflict and despite being uncomfortable and despite being, you know, um, sort of conflicted about this, uh, she, she carried on uh, with, with her activities. So, you know, hence, again, norms and values, uh, you know, they're, 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 you, you, we need to understand to what extent, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're um, powerful and, uh, you know, actually material structural conditions sometimes, uh, you know, are probably far more important than, than uh, a lot of our normative concerns. So concluding thoughts. Gulzad, am I doing okay on time? Just final? Couple of minutes. Okay, good, excellent. Yeah. So, um, If, if you if you read, read various you know uh, uh, scholars like you know Michael Hudson and and uh, um, Matsukata you know explains this brilliantly in her book on the value of everything uh, you know and Pettifor and others you, you can you can tell how you know throughout uh, you know time history for millennia humanity actually tried to evaluate money uh, and and they always did it in relation to uh, well-being and, and uh, this notion of productivity. So, um, so this, this, this uneasiness about money and, and what's, what's you know, uh, a good way of, of uh, managing money was always there. Um, now in post-Soviet Central Asia, uh, I would argue there is, there is, because of the sheer fact that uh, money is such a scarce commodity and uh, there is a monopoly on credit. Uh, the, the, the lending happens only with commercial institutions. There is this uh, transformation from money as, as functional money to money as, as a, a um, fictitious capital. And, and that's just the, uh, you know, the sheer power of uh, material structural conditions. And, and uh, 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 this is this is this is something that you know uh, was very obvious in in, in our research, um, and uh, the the interesting thing is that you know the neoliberal morality of money actually reversed the classical understanding of of uh, uh, of, of, of of rent. Uh, when when Adam Smith was defining free market, uh, he actually meant specifically free market free from rent. And now the you know neoliberalized you know uh, values uh, you know they they justified and legitimized rent, 
So this is this is the irony and the tragedy of, of, of the whole situation, really. Um, Polanyi, well, apart from you know, uh, sort of um, uh, you know, talking about you know how how uh, commodification of uh, things like money is 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 just you know a violation of their true and essential nature, warned that this type of uh, um, this this is unsustainable, and and that that, that uh, you know sooner or later. Um, this is going to lead to all kinds of social crisis, and clearly we know what happened in 2008. Uh, and and uh, uh, Polanyi basically, you know, also predicted that uh, society, because this is unsustainable, because it produces so much misery, uh, that society inevitably is going to, um, you know, react with what we call protective counter movements, uh, i.e., you know, that there are going to be social mobilizations against uh, uh, commodification. Um, and they have actually emerged both in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. In Kazakhstan, they emerged after the financial crisis in 2008. In Kyrgyzstan, uh, around 2010, and uh, Oshavans had a lot to do with that. Uh, and uh, and uh, what's important is that these uh, social movements have been uh, fighting back. Uh, they made some sort of, you know, um, uh, progress. Uh, but, you know, this battle is still ongoing and, uh, you know, uh, I don't have the time to talk about the, the actual sort of, you know, uh, social movement, perhaps this is something that can come up in the uh, Q&A session. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Elmira. Thank you so much.